Eagles Entertainment. The journey to the draft is driven by AAA. AAA, roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, joined by Chris McPherson from our hotel room here in Mobile, Alabama. We're here on the scene at the Reese's Senior Bowl, excited for this week of action that we've got coming to us, C-Mac, because uh, we've got a lot to cover. Look, we did our preview podcast with Ben Fennel last week. So, look, today, you know, I did my uh, my annual little preview thread on Twitter where we kind of co- went through a couple superlative categories. You can go check that out on my Twitter feed, at FDuffy3. But we're going to dive into that a little bit. We'll talk about about some of these players that we're excited to see over the next few days and who Eagles fans in particular uh, should be excited to hear more about. But uh, we'll get into that in Draft Buzz. After that, we'll answer some questions in Draft Mailbag and kind of call it a day. Well, we're going to let this roll. We've got a busy day tomorrow. We've got weigh-ins first thing Tuesday morning, two practices in the afternoon. We've got media day as well, so we'll get a chance to talk to a bunch of these guys. Really, really excited to get things going. So uh, let's get into the top of the show here with Draft Buzz. But before we get the show started, again, just a quick reminder, for those of you who who have not yet done it. Just go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. It's the best way to throw us your support. We're hitting draft season now. Senior Bowl uh, is here. We, you know, the, the peak le- listenership, everybody's looking for this kind, of a con- this kind of content, this kind of a podcast. So to help those people find it, if you enjoy this show, the best way to help others find it is to go and leave a comment, and then it boosts us up the, ra- the rankings on all those different platforms. So just uh, throw us some love there whenever you get a chance. Really, really appreciate it. All right, let's get into the top of the show. It's time for Draft Buzz. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. Man, I could just tell by your voice, tone of voice, you are just amped. This I'm is, ready to go. This is it. This is it. It's big time. This, this is – where Fran Duffy likes to shine. We're paint the scene a little bit here. We're in Philadelphia Airport, getting ready uh, for our flight early Monday morning, and former Eagles director of PR, Derek Boyko, he's on our flight to Charlotte as well, and he sees you, and the first thing he goes is, Fran, this is your Super Bowl, isn't it? He knows how much you love it. He and knows how much I love it. This is, uh, I mean, you, you know how it is. I, look, I love the X's and O's. I love everything about football, uh, but the X's and O's, alongside the the team building aspect of the NFL draft and uh, free agency, the off season. I mean, that's the you know that's the kind of stuff I've got a lot of juice for. And I know a lot of our listeners out there, you know, they, they may have grown up playing. Uh, Madden, you know, may have played, grown up playing uh, NCAA football, you know, on PlayStation or Xbox, and you get a sense of, oh, you know, I, I love building a team. I like taking it from the ground up and, you know, building it in franchise mode. I did all those same things when I was a kid, and that's the kind of that kind of leads into my love uh, of post of the off season and uh, helping build a team, make it better, and that's part of the uh, this this part of the year always gives me a lot of juice. What was ten year old Fran uh, using to punch out the scouting reports? That's the only thing Oof. that I picture would be a little bit different. Yeah, it was a little nowadays. bit different back then. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't doing uh, scouting reports necessarily, but definitely was watching the draft uh, and glued to my couch uh, all two days of the NFL draft. Remember, that was Saturday, <laughs> Sunday back then. Uh, I remember vividly sitting there Sunday afternoons and sitting and watching all the names come across the screen as uh, the rest of my family looked at me in bewilderment. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, like I said, this, is, this gives me a lot of juice this time of year. The second day of the draft used to be such an absolute marathon especially the years where the Eagles would have like 10 picks and then you're getting to like the seventh round and there's three seventh rounders. And, you know, obviously those can become pivotal building blocks of your football team. But on a day where you're already writing stories about five or six draft picks, uh, I definitely like the – do you like the the three-day? Three-day model? uh, You know, I, I, I get it. I, I enjoyed the two-day marathon because each one kind of felt a little bit longer. Like, I, I love day three of the draft. I, I've always loved day three of the draft. Um, you know, the, what is day three now? Uh, and day two used to give me that same kind of juice. But, uh, no, I, 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 see, I get it. I get why, you know, it's, uh, they've made that move to go in that direction. All right, so as Fran said, he did his Senior Bowl preview, and – in the past, he's done a full-fledged article that we would have on PhiladelphiaEagles.com or the app. We, he scaled it back last year for the first time, and it's simply a Twitter thread, and it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you're talking about watching like Van Gogh 
or Picasso <laughs> in their prime. We're on a brief layover, about about maybe 90 minutes or so in Charlotte. A little bit less. It felt like less anyway. Right, well, you know, by the time we get to the gate, definitely much less. <laughs> yep. Uh, so we're getting ready. We're waiting for our flight to Pensacola, Florida, and and Fran, you know, they're starting to. You see the clock countdown with like you know time to boarding and. You know, Fran's just punching away. He's got the paper roster shuffling all over the place to get through all the names to get this out there. And he found a way to get it done. I got it. I got it out. He found a way to get it done. You know what it is? I I like, and this is kind of how my mind works in terms of, like, looking at big groups of players. This is scary. It's kind of categorizing them into little groups and saying, all right, like, if you give each guy a little bit of a superlative, uh, it just gives people a reason to to talk about them and a, and a way to kind of think about them. So the way I did it was I broke it up into a, into a couple of different groups, and I've done it over the last couple of years in the same way all, all for this week. And you know, really the big thing is you know top dog. Who's the top guy that you know has me the most excited coming into the week? Who's got the most to gain? Who's got the who's the prospect that could see their stock rise the most? Who's the practice star? Someone who we expect to really do well in drills. And obviously this is someone different than the top dog or most to gain. And then lastly. Just just a, uh, an under-the-radar. It could be a small school guy, a sleeper, a position switch, someone that is just uh, you know flying a little bit under the, the public radar right now. Uh, but just four categories. I could have done eight, uh, as, as you know, from editing the pieces <laughs> yeah. I used to do for PhiladelphiaEagles.com. But uh, no, I, right now I figured we'll just go with those four categories. And the, I, I always found myself struggling. Oh, man, I'd really like a way to kind of squeeze this guy into the equation. But uh, with the character limit on Twitter, it's a little bit tough to do. So we're not going to go through every single name, okay? No. Go, go yeah. to AF. Duffy3 on Twitter. You can read the entire thread there and look at all the names. And if you haven't, our preview podcast that we did yes. with Ben Fennel is outstanding. We touched on you know three or four guys at least at every single position except specialist coming into uh, this week of action. So certainly make sure you listen to that. Go on Twitter to read the thread, and we'll just give a synopsis here. But you know why is this week important? I remember this was my first exposure to the draft guys at this time a year ago, and I remember that we got to see guys like Andre Dillard yep. here, here in Mobile, and you saw the athleticism, you saw the quick feet, and the question about him coming into the week was, and it was kind of parroted after he was drafted, how would he fare in the run game because of the pass-heavy workload that they had at Washington State. Sure. But he looked he was impressive in the one-on-one drills. I, I just remember he, he caught – he won the draft process from the standpoint of he looked great in action here during the practices. His athleticism shined at the combine. And the fact that he was still available for the Eagles when he was, it was the right move for the Eagles to jump up and to be able to get – a player who they think is going to be the left tackle, expected to be the left tackle of the future. Yeah, and a player that they talked to at the you know in the meetings at night here uh, at the Senior Bowl a year ago. So it just goes to show not just what he did on the practice field because I believe he was the offensive lineman of the week last year, but also uh, you know what the guys can do at night in terms of meeting. Everyone makes a big deal about the meetings at the combine, which are obviously uh, extremely extremely important. But those same kinds of meetings happen here, and they could be a little bit longer because the combine they're a hard fifteen minutes in and out. Here with the, at the Senior Bowl, they can be a little bit longer, so teams can spend a little bit more time with these guys on a you know more intimate basis. Whereas you know they don't necessarily get that luxury in Indianapolis. So in terms of the quality of competition this week, okay, looking back to last year with Andre Dillard, Dillard was one of ten first round picks who played at the Senior Bowl last year. Overall, ninety three total draft picks came out of the Senior Bowl, forty of them in the first three rounds. So the first two days of the draft produced 40 players who suited up here in Mobile, Alabama, and some of the other names here. Daniel Jones from the Giants, who we got to see late in the season there. Yep. Uh, Debo Samuel was a, our easily, for I think both of us, the player of the week yeah. down here last year. And, you know, he's part of that Niners team that won the NFC Championship. Garrett Bradbury comes to mind. We saw Montez Sweat, Darnell Savage. Uh, all players who increased their stock here in mobile a year ago. So that's that. That's what you're getting ready to look at this week. It seems like for pretty much everyone around the league, especially for fans who are 
you know, their team is out of it. They want to start to turn a page. Senior Bowl is now the time to get on board, and we're glad you're joining us here on the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. So, Fran, you, you want to get into the thread here? Yeah, let's get into it. Now, I think, you know, just starting a quarterback, obviously, for Eagles fans, they're not necessarily worried about uh, who the top quarterback is, but I think it's an important discussion to have regardless. Number one, because it can still impact the Eagles with uh, who can go ahead of them in the top 20, who can bump some of these players down. And I think, to me, Look, I think I'm probably in the minority on this in terms of the, you know, what do you would say, the mainstream media covering the NFL draft. I really like Justin Herbert. I really do. I think there's a lot of traits to work with there. But I am just infatuated with Jordan Love and what he can bring from a skill set standpoint. Maybe I was just so enthralled with what I saw as a sophomore. But uh, this kid's got top, top, top shelf physical tools. Uh, excited to kind of talk to him because I don't know much about him away from the field. I haven't seen any interviews with him yet. So excited for Tuesday, honestly, tomorrow to be able to watch him and, and just kind of be around him a little bit and get a sense of, of how he carries himself and uh, how teammates respond to him and things like that. That's going to be really, really interesting to watch with Jordan Love because if the intangibles are there, uh, this kid should be a top top ten pick. I mean, I, to me, that, and that's just in my, in my estimation. I remember coming here in 2016 – and that's kind of how Carson Wentz was viewed at that time. Was yeah. you know Carson Wentz? Oh, you know, middle first round, late first round. He'll be you know the, one of those guys to look at. That's where Jordan Love is right now. He came down here, had a great week of practice, cemented himself. You improved the character and all that. Everybody rallied around him in practice. He's the number two pick in the draft, and that's kind of how I think uh, it could go. Could go with a Jordan Love and Justin Herbert. You're throwing that same boat. So uh, both guys. If you're an Eagles fan. You're hoping for both guys to look really, really good down here uh, in front of all 32 NFL teams. Will certainly help that Joe Burrow, the Heisman Trophy winner, is not here in attendance this week. So Jordan Love working with the North team, which is being coached by the Detroit Lions, who have the number three overall pick, could be very intriguing there as they have to figure out you know, how, how much more does Matthew Stafford have to give. I mean, this could be a developmental pick for – down the line, Lions picking up, you know, this early in the draft. If Jordan Love has a big week, you know, the the North coaches led by Matt Patricia and the Lions staff, they're going to be able to be with him all week to see what he's all about. You can't ask for a better opportunity to look at a potential future prospect than that. Yeah, and I think ultimately, you know, in the past, over the f- last few years, we've seen eight quarterbacks in attendance down here in Mobile. This year, only six. And I don't think that that speaks to the depth of this class. I think it more speaks to the fact that, you know what, they were really waiting. They were really hoping that uh, Joe Burrow was going to be able to attend. Um, and they weren't going to string another player along as a replacement in the meantime. That's just my take on the situation. I don't think uh, – I haven't been told that. But, you know, they're not going to string, let's say, a Nate Stanley from Iowa or somebody like that along and say, hey, you know what, if Joe Burrow says yes, then okay, you know, thanks but no thanks. But if he says no, you pack your bags, you'll come here tomorrow, I don't think that they'd strung, uh, strung him along like that. So they waited and waited and waited for Joe Burrow, obviously with the national title game being just le- you know just less than a week ago. Uh, they did not get that decision until late in the week. But uh, yeah, regardless, six talented quarterbacks down here. Uh, we've got the two headliners. There are still some interesting guys, especially if you're looking for developmental backups. You know, Steven Montez from Colorado is an interesting player that's got arm talent. Shea Patterson from Michigan has some arm talent as well. I expect both those guys to, to flash this week. Jalen Hurts, everybody knows, from Oklahoma, former uh, Heisman winner, and a guy that I think when you look at Jalen Hurts, uh, look, the, the athleticism is there. The arm strength is there. The, matter, you know, the fact of the matter, can he be accurate enough, consistently accurate enough from the pocket? I think that'll be the big thing he's got to prove this week. I'm glad you brought up Hurts because we really didn't touch on him on the preview podcast last week, and even in your Twitter thread, you didn't mention him. And not that he's you know not top of mind here, in Mobile, Alabama, but good to get a little mention there, and we'll get to see him on the practice fields this week. So as we transition to the running backs, Eno Benjamin, you spoke a lot about on the preview podcast. He's your top dog in attendance, but Josh Kelly, you have as your under-the-radar selection. Let us know a little bit more about this other Pac-12 running back. Yeah, so he, there were some pretty high hopes for him coming into the season. Uh, he's a transfer from UC Davis. So he played there in 2017, transferred up to UCLA. He's got pretty good size, 5'11", right around two, 215 pounds. We'll get a good idea uh, of what he looks like tomorrow. But when you look at his skill set, he's got speed to get to the corner. He's a really natural receiver. He's got a short area burst. I wish he was able to make that first man miss a little bit better, but I think when you look at Josh Kelly, 
very similar skill set to like a Tevin Coleman. You know, when he was coming out of Indiana, uh, the plays that he was able to make with the Atlanta Falcons and obviously with the NFC champion 49ers as well in, in flashes this year. I think when you look at Josh Kelly and if you really, really like him, he can be that kind of a player. And so this is a guy that can make an impact in an NFL backfield, uh, but he's not really being talked about right now. So I think if you look at uh, someone who can really help themselves this week, I think Josh Kelly with a strong week of practice could really do exactly that. He's a guy that I think, uh, when healthy, has proven that he's got NFL talent. Obviously, uh, you know, play, he's a track guy uh, coming from, from California. Uh, you know, he actually, one thing from his bio, C-Mac, he, okay. think, he thinks that he would be the perfect fit as a lead in Rocky. Which, uh, really? Yeah, that was uh, from his bio. A little <laughs> nugget, a little Philly-related nugget. I'll have to get, get get a quote on, from him about that one. That's a good one there. That's the, the kind of stuff you only get from the Journey to the Draft podcast mm-hmm. driven by AAA. So, because I know you're not – you struggle to be concise in your – Yes. In your writing especially where you're allowed to <laughs> let loose. Uh, but you had to do it here on Twitter. Yes. So was there anyone who you wanted to shout out amongst mm-hmm. the running backs but – didn't have the uh, character account to be able to do yeah, so. Yeah, that's a good one. I think um, ultimately, look, I was able to get Antonio Gibson in there. He's a guy that I think is really fascinating entering this week of practice. Um, if I had to pick one guy, and of course, uh, you know, this is me being uh, uh, not concise at all, trying to decide which of the guys that I would pick. I think ultimately, jeez. Um, I think I probably would go with the Michael P. Ryan. Uh, he's a guy out of Florida um, that we didn't really talk about. And he, he's, a pl- he's an interesting player in that I think he's got a pretty high floor. He showed off a little bit more speed this year than I thought he'd have. He was the bell cow for the Gators. Um, I really like Darius Anderson from TCU as well, but we talked about him on the show last week on the preview show. I'm a big fan of what he brings to the table. But uh, I think Michael P. Ryan, he's got some NFL bloodlines. Um, is he Samaje's brother? He is Samaje's brother. Okay. Uh, and he is the cousin of Miles Jack, who was the, obviously oh, Samaje was right. as well. Um, but I, P. Ryan is a guy that uh, I would keep an eye on as a player that can help himself this week as well. All right, so going to the wide receivers, it's fascinating that Arizona State's produced, in your estimation, the best player at running back and at wide receiver in Brandon Ayuk here, uh, who was only a one-year starter. But the one person I want to ask you about, because you went deep into Ayuk on the last podcast, right. uh, Van Jefferson out mm-hmm. of Florida. And I love that uh, the one-word description you used with him was technician. Yep. He's, I think when you watch him, and I, so no, he transferred – uh, from Ole Miss. So he played in the same receiving core as DK Metcalf, as AJ Brown, uh, and as the other kid who I'm forgetting. He was at the Shrine Bowl last year. Um, but that trio of Ole Miss receivers. The DeAndre Brown? No, it was, oh, I forget the guy's name. He played the right receiver. Um, but when you looked at those, the, those four guys were together at Ole Miss in 2017. And I watched Van Jefferson back then, and, and you know I knew about him coming in as, oh, he's Sean Jefferson's son. Sean Jefferson, former NFL receiver, has one of the best receiver coaches in the NFL. Uh, now he's uh, in the New York with the New York Jets right now uh, as their receivers coach. <clears throat> when you look at Van Jefferson, this is a guy that I thought, all right, he's got pretty good size. He's got some speed. He can work vertically. Uh, he's pretty twitched up. I was expecting a, a, a real technician at the position. I didn't quite see it at Ole Miss, and I think that he's gotten better in a lot of those areas. You could tell that he started to uh, really kind of take to a little bit more coaching, much more consistent route runner now than he was at Ole Miss, much more consistent beating press coverage now than he when he was at Ole Miss. But I still want to see him get a little bit better, and that's actually where I think you see the flashes. There are plenty. If you go search Van Jefferson on, on Twitter right now, there are going to be plenty of highlights where the people say, oh, man, like look at him carve up this DB. Look at him get off the line uh, and beat press coverage here. I want to see him do it more consistently this week. So he's got the ability to be a true technician, and that's where uh, the Twitter uh, the character limit comes back to bite me. He's got the ability <laughs> to be that in the NFL. He's just got to do it more consistently. All the physical tools are there to, for him to be very good. He started 41 games in his career. I mean, he's, he's got a lot of starting reps in the SEC. Uh, excited to, to get a look at him in person because he's a guy I think should be one of the better receivers here when it's all said and done. Who were you upset about leaving off your list at wide receiver? Oof. Probably Devin Duvernay. Uh, we've, we've talked about him all throughout the summer and the fall. Uh, when I watched him or in that Texas duo, because Colin Johnson's here as well, when I watched uh, Colin Johnson and Devin Duvernay back in the summer, we'll say June, July, 
everyone was uh, Colin Johnson was in every mock draft. He was he was a first round pick, lock in May, June, July, back in the summer. Uh, big kid, and he's here. He's here, and he's obviously he's, there's plenty of talent there. But I like Devin Duvernay. He started on the left side. Colin Johnson got most of his reps on the right side. I saw kind of a. a a uh, combination between like a Debo Samuel, Pierre Garcon, that's kind of, you know, low, uh, thick lower half, yards after catch, speed to work deep. Uh, I saw a lot of that with Devin Duvernay, and then this year he busted out. He had a huge se- senior season, moved more into the slot, had a lot more success inside. So when I look at Devin Duvernay, this is a guy that I think can come down here, do a lot of the same things that Debo Samuel did a year ago here and hopefully uh, come through you know big time because he, he's got speed to work deep, but he's also a threat after the catch, can work over the middle of the field. He's tough. He can block. He's really competitive with the ball in his hands. This is a guy I think uh, he, he can really help himself with a strong week here. He's a guy that I really wish I was able to squeeze in to that thread because you know, C-Mac, everyone keeps receipts on the internet. So of course. If, I, if he has a big week, everyone's like, oh, friend, you didn't, you didn't mention him in the preview. I, I really wish that I did, but uh, Duvernay is a, a really talented player. Uh, I mean, you know, you could do honorable mention and kind of cover your bases that way so that everyone gets I'm not a hedger. I try so. not to be a hedger anyway. You know, it, it's funny, going back to that preview podcast, if you haven't listened to it, please do because – I don't know if Ben was upset that he didn't get to go on the Shrine Bowl trip because he was just spitting takes out left and right. <laughs> I, I was I was like, wow, where, where's this Ben been? Uh, and he, he's he's opinionated. He's all oh, he's always Ben's opinionated. Got plenty of opinion. That's why he's one of the best. But but he was really bringing the heat though on the last podcast. So yeah, predictions for a practice player of the week and things like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's what I mean. Yep. He was just throwing stuff out left and right. So uh, you remember it was last year Foster Moreau. Yes. Was here at the Senior Bowl. And he was a player who not really used much as a receiver. Uh, some questions about, you know. Uh, oh, he would have loved to play in this offense for LSU. Well, if, <laughs> if, could, he be, could he have been more of a pass catching no option? Could he have done that? And he certainly he showed during the week of Mobile that he could be that kind of player. Yep. Uh, Your most to gain amongst the tight ends, you have going back to LSU, Stephen Sullivan. Yep. What, so uh, Stephen Sullivan was listed at wide receiver for LSU and and I think he only caught I think he caught like 20 passes this year 15 passes I feel like he's that guy that has been listed at receiver his whole career but everyone kind of knew like you know what you're a tight end at the next level man and he just never quite bought in when they announced him for the game they announced him as a wide receiver slash tight end and now when you go to the depth chart when you go to the roster uh, on seniorbowl.com He's listed straight as a tight end, and this guy's got NFL size. He was a again a backup behind those you know those stud receivers. Uh, he didn't play at tight end behind Thaddeus Moss. So uh, this is a guy with if you just watch you know the, the, his targets this year, there's only a handful of them, uh, but he flashes. So I think when you ultimately uh, look at this kid, he'll go from completely off the radar because. No one's talking about Steven Sullivan right now. When you look at this tight end class, everyone's talking about some of these other players. No one's talking about Sullivan. At the end of the week, if he's got a couple highlights here, people are going to be talking about this kid as a, as a flex tight end, someone that can be moved around the formation. So that's why I kind of picked him as my guy uh, that's got the most to gain here in Mobile. I want to, it doesn't seem like, from my initial readings on this, that it's not a strong tight end class, especially maybe if you compare it to a year ago where you had a couple of guys like – you know, Noah Fan, you know, guys like that who are sure. definitely going to be going, TJ Hawkinson definitely going round one. Does it seem like maybe there's an opportunity for guys like Sullivan who, not going to say round one, but guys who really boost their stock if the uh, class isn't all that strong? Yeah, I think it's a class where it's not it's not top heavy. You know, there's not those, uh, even like, you know, when, when Dallas Goddard came down here a couple years ago, I, I loved Dallas Goddard. I thought he was a top 20 talent uh, in that 2018, yeah, 20, yeah, 2018 NFL draft. Um, you know, I, I love Dallas, and I don't like any of these guys quite as much as Dallas, but I think when you look at that, we'll say day two range, I think that there's a good amount of talent here. You know, between the guys that are down here, Harrison Bryant and Bryson Hopkins, uh, Jared Pinckney, I think a lot of people look at that way. Uh, I'm a big fan of Albert Okwebunam, the junior from Missouri. Uh, you know, there's a, 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 real, a few interesting, really interesting players uh, in that group. It's just not top heavy, so uh, there's not going to be the sexy names of T.J. Hawkinson and Noah Fant, Evan Ingram, and mm-hmm. uh, you know that whole group at, at the top of this draft. All right, let's go to O line, and uh, you know, I mean, look, Eagles play their games at Lincoln Financial Field. There's a guy here, Matt Hennessy, who played his games at Lincoln Financial Field for the Temple Owls. So I know you got to watch his tape 
on the flight this morning. Yeah, I hadn't watched him yet, and he was a junior and underclassman uh, who declared for the draft and pretty much instantly got scooped up by the senior bowl. They, uh, they, they gave that invite very quickly, and honestly, watching him, I could see why. This is a kid with really light feet. Um, you know, he's got a lot of range as a center inside, uh, not just in the run game, but in pass game as well. You can see he's got really light feet. He's a natural athlete. Uh, excited to kind of get a sense of his strength and just how he's built. Um, I do wonder, you know, when his technique's not perfect, he can get a ro- he can get rocked a little bit on contact, but uh, this is a guy that's got a lot of really interesting physical tools. Excited to get the real measurements on him. Obviously, as an underclassman, there aren't really uh, exact measurements out there on him, but uh, uh, Hennessy, uh, you know, in a couple games that I watched, this kid's got a lot of ability. He's got he's got starting potential in the NFL for sure, no question. It, it seems like every year there's going to be an interior lineman, you know, down here at this game. And I just think back to Bradbury last year, who yep. really really helped his stock to get himself uh, into the middle of the first round. In, in Bradbury's case last year, just you know, going into the week knowing what he can do. And I think there's some questions about could he anchor well enough? What would his you know size be, be an issue? And he did have some. You know, he did have some defeats in the one-on-one drills, obviously slanted towards D. Lyman, but nonetheless, uh, you could see what uh, would make him so appealing, especially to the more athletic uh, NFL offenses. Going to the defensive side of the ball, uh, intrigued to learn more about Tennessee's Daryl Taylor, who you have yes. as the most to gain, and you can't wait to see him in the one-on-one drills. So when you watch uh, defensive linemen, okay, there's uh, one of the things that you'll often hear, uh, and I, I say this all the time, is the guy's laid off the ball. And so the question then becomes is, why is the guy laid off the ball? Uh, and I'm not talking about he's not explosive, that he's not, he hasn't gained a lot of ground. I mean, like, everybody else has moved and he has not yet. And what, sometimes it can, you can tell by look at their eyes. Where, where, what are they looking at before the snap? And Darrell Taylor, in his role as the strong side linebacker in that 3-4 scheme down there for Tennessee, he was asked to read the man across because he was often lined up to the tight end side he wasn't reading the ball. He's not, you know, you think about like Eagles defensive ends when they're lined up pre-snap, hand in the ground, they've got their eyes going right down the line of scrimmage, staring at the football when the ball snap, they go. That's not the case with Terrell Taylor. He's watching the tight end and he's going off the tight end's first movement. So he's going to be a little bit slow off the ball. And then there were times where you watched him and it was like third and long and he's not playing as a Sam backer. He's just playing as a rush defensive end and he's reading the ball and he flies upfield out of his stance. And you could see his pass rush potential on those downs. He just wasn't used that way all the time. And so a lot of people say, oh, you know, Darrell Taylor, he's laid off the ball. He's not really a, a quality pass rusher. The production didn't always match. I look at him and I see traits that really, really work uh, in terms of his ability to, to win off the ball. Um, Needs to get better in a couple of his areas in terms of his hands and his overall rush plan. I thought he took some strides in the right direction in that realm this season, but still some work to do there. But this is a well-rounded player who can drop in coverage. He can play special teams. He defends the run. He can set the edge. Uh, and also with the pass rush potential, to me, this is one of the, the one of the more underrated players in this class. I'm, I'm excited because you know, you know how it is. You come down here and one-on-ones, you see him flying around people you know, at his size, he, he could raise some eyebrows. So this is a, that, that's a name for sure that I'm excited to watch more about. We've talked a lot about him uh, on the podcast. Uh, uh, ben had seen him live early in the season. So, uh, you know, we had so, some really good conversations early in the fall about Terrell Taylor. I'm excited to see him down here for the first time live. Was there anyone amongst the edge rushers who you left off who you wanted to include? Cool. Uh, so there are a bunch of guys here that I'm really I'm, I'm excited about Terrell Taylor. I'm excited about Terrell Lewis. Uh, Jonathan Grenard was a guy we talked about on the preview podcast that I couldn't wait to see. Uh, I mentioned Bradley and I as a player I really like. One guy that I think is really intriguing, and I want to make sure that he didn't get taken off because there were a bunch of late ads here. Um, so I want to make sure that he is still here, and he is. Trayvon Hill from Miami, okay, is a transfer from Virginia Tech. Uh, he transferred. He had, he started the first couple games down there for the Hokies in 2018 and then got kicked off the team. And there was a thought, oh, is he going to enter the 2019 draft? He ended up transferring to Miami and playing this year. And he didn't have a ton of production, but when you watch him on film, he's a little bit small. He's 6'3", right around 240 pounds. But this kid is explosive. He has got a great first step. He can win in a lot of different ways. I, I really like the amount of moves that he's got in his toolbox. He, the question is going to be, obviously, the off-field stuff. Got to figure out what happened there at Virginia Tech. Just his strength, that 240 pounds, can he hold up? So I'm interested to see how big he is here. But we talked about Grenard last week, c about mm-hmm. how, uh, oh, you know what, those guys that can just run by people, they'll flash in practice. 
Trevon Hill is a guy that I think could flash this week in practice. Now, you mentioned Terrell Lewis. He's your top dog amongst the edge rushers. How about his teammate, Raekwon Davis, who you have amongst the interior linemen on the defensive side with the most to gain here in Mobile? Yeah, the reason why is, you know, and I look, I've watched him on film now, C-Mac, for three years because they're going back. To, he's a, he's a, uh, a senior. I remember watching him on his sophomore tape because the guys that are built like him at 6'7", 315 pounds, you know, he's got like a condor wingspan. He's built like DeForest Buckner. Like that, that's, that's what he Massive. looks like on film I he had like I think he had eight and a half sacks or like ten and a half sacks something like that in his sophomore season and, and so everyone's like oh top five pick top ten pick uh it was eight and a half sacks in his sophomore year then last year playing next to Quinn and Williams top five pick by the Jets he only had one and a half sacks and then this year I believe he only had one sack or might have even just been a half a sack against LSU so he's had two set two full sacks in the last two years can he rush the passer at 6'7", 315 pounds with 35 and a quarter inch arms? Does he have that ability to get after the quarterback? If he does, he's DeForest Buckner. If he doesn't, all right, he's Ashawn Robinson. He's a good run defender, and you know uh, he can give you a little bit of juice as a pass rusher, but not often. And you're talking about a second-round pick. I think that he's got the ability to be a top five, top ten talent overall in this draft. He's got that ability in his body. That potential is there. The question is, can he put it all together? You know, he was never – the production, for sure, that, that's that been a question over the last couple of years. But, you know, you watch him as a pass rusher, he's just not as developed as you would want, especially for a guy that has played as many as, uh, as many years as he has. He's been an impact player for them for the last three seasons. So I think when you look at Raekwon Davis, a lot of potential. Can he put it together in a new scheme? Because we've seen some of these Alabama guys, you know, they've they've come out and it's, it's taken them a little bit of time. But eventually they hit it. You know, they're the kid that's out in Seattle uh, right now, uh, whose name is escaping me, uh, the nose tackle. Um, it, you know, it took him a couple years, and he was kind of in the same boat. Junior college transfer, great run defender, took him a little bit of time. Then he got in, you know, he got into the swing of it, and he had double digit sacks uh, a year ago. And then he was suspended the first few games this year, came in, made a huge impact for them once he came back out in the field. So I think when you look at Raekwon Davis, plenty of potential. It's all about can he, you know, can he put it all together and be consistent this week? I think he's got the most to gain, maybe more so than anybody uh, in this entire Senior Bowl event. You talking about Jaron Reed? Jaron Reed, Jaren thank Reed. you. So let's go to the linebackers. I don't think we touched on from Appalachian State. Yes, good Akeem one. Davis Gaithersburg. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at this kid, uh, he is really explosive. I mean, he's six two. He's built like a safety, and that's why I think the weigh-ins will be very important for him. Uh, I, the weight I have is right around 215 pounds, which, I mean, that's that's very small, <laughs> obviously, for a linebacker. Uh, he reminds me on film of Jerome Baker. I don't know if you remember him out of Ohio State a couple of years ago, who was built in a similar way. Ended up going, I believe, in the fourth round, maybe the third round, to the Miami Dolphins. And he's become an every-down player for them. Uh, he's kind of the new-age linebacker in that he can play sideline to sideline. He's got top-end speed. I love his short area burst. He can play, play going in reverse as well. Really good man-to-man -man coverage player. Um, really productive. You know, he's led the team in tackling tackle machine. Season. I was yeah. going to say, I know he's a tackling machine when when uh, the Eagles were preparing to face them this season. So. Yeah, and when you look at Akeem Davis Gaither, uh, his dad is a is a coach as well. His dad's a wide receivers coach in the MAC at Western Michigan. Um, you know, this is a guy that I think when you look at Akeem Davis Gaither. There's there's a lot to work with there from a, a, a speed standpoint, ability to play in coverage. The question is. Does he have the strength, the play strength, to be able to hold up in the box against the NFL offensive lines and the NFL run schemes on a down by down basis? That's going to be the big question. A lot of people are going to be interested to see uh, what he looks like up close in weigh-ins on Tuesday morning. Now, again, to the corners, you mentioned uh, before the podcast yep. you felt that there was uh, a lot of talent that had to drop out. Yes, for myriad reasons here in Mobile. That's so we lost, uh, no Trevon Diggs from Alabama. Uh, Jeff Gladney from TCU dropped out. Um, he was someone you were very excited yeah, I was, to, I was to watch. Because, you know, without Diggs here, and I, I, I love Trevon Diggs, you know, the kid from Alabama I think is a stud. Um, Gladney was the guy that I was really, really excited to see uh, from that group. You know, Bryce Hall's injured. Uh, Christian Fulton will be down here. A.J. Green from Oklahoma State will be down here. But Damon Arnett had to pull out from Ohio State. Uh, he was another guy that I, I was excited about. So uh, they, they, they lost. They had a, a little bit of attrition at the cornerbacks. I, I was intrigued by the, your choice for practice star Darnay Hall. Holmes, a former five-star recruit. Yes. Uh, so when you look at Darnay Holmes, I, I didn't know much about him. I watched him late, uh, I want to say late last week. 
he was a top 15 player in the in the country coming out of high school. Uh, I mean, he was a big time, big time recruit out of Pasadena. So he stayed home uh, to play for UCLA, became a day one starter. Um, you know, and obviously playing for for Chip Kelly and J Jerry Asinaro, uh out there you know, at UCLA. Uh, this is a guy that plays inside. He plays outside. I like his competitiveness. I, you like the versatility. He's a good athlete. He's not super explosive, okay? So the long speed is going to be a question, um, and that's why he might better be better off playing in the slot as opposed to outside. But uh, this is an intriguing player that I think, honestly, he could be – it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me, especially with Gladney a lot here, if he stole a lot of the headlines as the top corner here because I think between him and A.J. Green, A.J. Green, the big question, I'm telling you, what, like A.J. Green – this kid looks the part. He's over 6'1". He's 194 pounds. Great press corner. I mean, he looks the part up at the line of scrimmage. He can play man-to-man. -man. I like his instincts. He's just got to find the ball. Like, And if he makes some plays, finding the ball downfield in one-on-ones, team drills, doesn't matter, he's going to be one of those guys whose stock goes through the roof. And I think with Darnay Holmes, that's going to be the same kind of a thing. Different kind of players. But I think with Darnay Holmes and A.J. Green, I think both those guys could really, really help themselves with a strong week of practice. You know, you were on the ball last week at the Shrine Bowl with Luther Kirk, the safety from Eastern Illinois, as a guy to watch. And he earned defensive MVP honors in the game. Yep. So you have another small school safety to keep your eye on this week in Kyle Duger. Yeah. There, there's, there was a lot of buzz about this kid coming into the season. I actually studied him, and I – I mean, I've never watched Lenore Ryan before ever. I was going to say, where they're, is they're, Lenore they're, they're Ryan? Division two. I couldn't tell you exactly where they're at. I'm going to um, Google on that. But well. I will tell you that he's, he's a kid from Georgia. Um, I've never watched Lenore Ryan, and I certainly have never watched Lenore Ryan in, Jan or in July. Uh, <laughs> and I watched this kid in July. He is well put together, man. I mean, he is going to look the part at weigh-ins. Um, you know, he was on Bruce Feldman's freak list back in the summer. Uh, and when you look at this kid, he was a four-year starter. Uh, there are the, I'm going off freak list numbers right now, C-Mac. 4-4 in the 40 at 220 pounds. 6-7 in the three-cone, ridiculous time. 132 inches in the broad jump, 40 inches in the vert. Without context, that you might just be like, all right, well, those numbers kind of wash over you. You don't really get it. But I'm telling you, those numbers are outstanding for a guy his size at the safety spot. So when you look at Kyle Duger, uh, this is a guy who's got size, speed potential, really, really physical. This guy gets after it. The big question is going to be coming from Division Two: is the speed of the game going to be a little too much? How long will it take him to get up to speed there? If he comes down here and doesn't flinch and looks the part, this guy could go day two, uh, like an early day two. He could end up being a top 50, top 60 pick. The potential is there. There are a couple safeties here, C-Mac, with that top 60, top 70 potential that if they could just answer a couple things, like in terms of play speed, he they're going to be high picks in this draft. Uh, Lenore Ryan is in Hickory, North Carolina. So we actually uh, we were in North Carolina. There we go. Or today. Uh, I figure you want to give some love to Kayvon Wallace. So I know you've been banging the drum for him. So. Yeah. so to me, I think when you look at strong safeties in today's NFL, it used to be like, oh, strong safety is the guy who's a run defender, the thumper, you know, basically an extra linebacker. That can't be the case in today's NFL. You have to be able to play in coverage. So I think when you look at today's strong safety, that guy's got to be able to come down, not just play in the box because he's got to be able to be comfortable near the line of scrimmage, but he's got to be able to play man-to-man -man against the slot. He's got to be able to get after the quarterback. He's got to be able to be uh, versatile in terms of how you use him in coverage. He can play deep. He can play middle zones. He can play out in the perimeter. He can be flexed out with a running back out wide or a tight end out wide. He's got to have that skill set. Kayvon Wallace has that skill set. The question is his size. He's under 5'11", so you know he's a little bit shorter. His arms are shorter. Does he have that ability to match up with bigger receivers, bigger tight ends, and then the long speed? Does he have that ability to be stressed vertically and be able to carry receivers on those vertical routes down the field? But this is a tough kid. He's smart. He's vertical, or he's uh, versatile. He's got gr uh, great instincts down near the line of scrimmage. I just want to see size speed-wise. Does he have that ability to match up? That'll be something big to be able to watch here. One of the names I wrote down was Avante Maddox. That was the name I wrote down hmm. while watching Kayvon Wallace. Uh, this is a guy that really, really impressed me on film. But again, he's just not hes not going to be super sexy when we go out to the Combine in Indianapolis. He's not that guy that's going to tear things up on the track, but a uh, really, really impressive football player.
All right, so those are Fran Duffy's players to watch. Again, go to his Twitter handle, at FDuffy3, for the entire thread, and make sure to listen to the previous episode of the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA, for a more extensive preview of what to look for this week here at the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama. Fran, I think it's time to answer some questions. Yeah, I think we're uh, let's get to some uh, draft mail back here. Let's do it. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans in the draft mailbag. All right, so this one is from Irish Champagne. And again, this is from uh, <laughs> people on Twitter that uh, responded to some of the some of the tweets in the thread and then also sent some questions later. But the best way to get your questions answered is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a comment, and it'll get answered uh, here on the show. But uh, from Irish Champagne... I just want to know the story behind the Twitter handle. That, I think, to me, is one of the more fascinating things when you get some of these Twitter handles. Yeah, yeah that uh, can be scary at times. But That's true. Uh, James, this guy's a big fan of James Proch, the, uh, the SMU receiver. James Proch Hive, he's fantastic. Really hoping he has a strong week. Would absolutely love to see him in Cleveland. And uh, see, my guy kind of thought, all right, Let's just kind of talk through uh, some James Prosh real quick because he was the guy I did not mention, um, you know, on the preview podcast. I did mention him in my. No, you talked. You guys talked. I, mean, I mentioned you, him on the thread. You talked about the. No, you talked about in the preview podcast. Did we? Oh, there's yeah, there's definitely some James Prosh right. love in there. Oh well, yeah. All no. right. Well, this is a guy that watching him kind of reminded me of Jameson Crowder was the name I wrote down. You know, five ten and a half. He's a little bit on the smaller side, but. He's quick. He's a savvy route runner. He's got good hands. He plays with a little bit of an edge. He's got some uh, some toughness to him. Uh, size, speed is going to be the question. He's going to be in the four fives at the forty uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, he's again a little bit on the smaller side, but. Uh, this is a kid who was a four-star recruit. He's not some small school kid. He was a four-star recruit coming out of Dallas, you know, big area. Uh, was a Blitnikoff Award semifinalist this year, first team All AAC. Uh, this kid's a pretty accomplished receiver. Was one of one, one of the more productive receivers in college football in 2019. He's got the ability to come in and play in the slot. I, I, I'm a big fan of James Proch. Uh, so we got to that question first, and then we got a couple other here, C Mac. Okay. That I wanted to also get to uh, real quick. Let me just pull it up on my Twitter feed. Uh, Ba, 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 ba. All right, here we go. So give me your brief assessment uh, on the following players. This is from uh, the, at the Willis Factor. Uh, Javin White from UNLV, safety. Wide receiver Chris Rowland from Tennessee State. Uh, and then linebacker Sean Bradley from Temple. So uh, J.R. Willis, I believe all three of these guys, CMAC, were players from the NFL PA game, which we did not attend. I did hear some good buzz on Chris Rowland, the Tennessee State kid, uh, who from my understanding, and I have not done him yet, is small but explosive and twitchy, gets out in and out of breaks really, really well. So I'm excited to kind of get into him a little bit later. I have done Sean Bradley, uh, a Temple kid. They have got they have got a couple linebackers actually uh, in this class, and one of them, Bradley, was at the NFL PA game. I think when you look at Bradley, uh, this was a guy that was a Temple tough kid, so you know one of the, the nine toughest players uh, in college football or on the uh, on the roster there. A local kid as well from Mount Holly, New Jersey. He's really tough. I like his competitiveness downhill. He's got the ability to come down and bang against uh, lead blockers. He's got a good feel for navigating in tight spaces, defeating blocks and traffic. I just want to get, see, you know, the speed is a little bit of a question mark. The ability to play sideline to sideline. I want to see him get a little bit better playing through contact as well. I, I mentioned the fact that he can navigate through traffic. He can find a way to sneak into tight cracks. But once he makes contact, he didn't have a lot of success. And I watched that game against Maryland where, you know, that, that group, that front seven was pivotal in terms of Temple beating Maryland in that game. Um, but ultimately, I want to see him get a little bit better playing through contact. But I did like what I, some of the things I saw from Sean Bradley on film. So uh, good question there from, uh, from J.R. Willis. But uh, just a couple that we figured we'd get to here on the end of the show. Look, we've got a long week ahead of us. We've got uh, practices starting on Tuesday. We'll be here for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practices. Friday, we'll kind of put a bow on everything and preview the game. So make sure you're tuning in every day here on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. We've got a lot coming your way here from Mobile, Alabama.